You've probably heard that putting gravel in the bottom of a pot does not increase drainage. I've known about this myth for a very long time. But when I go and look for an explanation as to why that happens, I've never been satisfied with the answers I get. People do try to explain it, and they talk about something called a perched water table, but it's never explained very well. Other people try to demonstrate it with sponges. Right? They take a sponge and have it stand upright, and then they turn it sideways, and water runs out of it. But we don't do that with pots. I mean, I'm not taking my pot and turning it sideways or upside down. So I've never found the sponge a very good example of how this works in a pot. So I went on a quest to get a good explanation and to find a demo that shows the phenomena to me, that convinces me that it is actually real. In this program, I'm going to explain perched water table, I'm going to explain why gravel doesn't work in a pot, and then I'm going to show you a demo that I think is convincing. This is a phenomenon that's really important for you to understand because it affects everything growing in containers. So let's start with a pot of soil. Now in this program, I'm going to talk about soil, but this applies to any kind of media we put in the pot. A soilless mix like peat moss or core, a mixture of soil and compost, compost alone, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to use the word soil for convenience, but I'm talking about anything that goes inside a pot. What happens when we pour water in the top? Well, the water starts soaking into the soil and nothing comes out of the bottom because I haven't put enough water in yet. So I'm going to add some more water. The soil is now getting super wet, but nothing yet. Let's add some more. Well, now I've got lots of water coming out. Now, you might be interested in my watering can here. I've been using this for about 20 years to water my house plants, and I think it's just a perfect tool. And these are really inexpensive if you go to one of those used stores. So why did water come dripping out of the pot? Well, that's fairly obvious. Gravity. Gravity pulls everything down. And it also acts on water. So when I put water in the top of the pot, gravity is going to pull it through the soil. But water is also kind of sticky. And it sticks to the soil. So when I added just a small amount of water into dry soil, Nothing comes out because there wasn't enough water. That water has to saturate the soil first. But once that soil is saturated, gravity takes over and pulls the excess out the bottom. Now let's redo that experiment, but this time we're going to use a pot of dry soil and water it from below. So I'm going to take the pot and just set it in some water. What happens? Well, you know that water sucks up into the pot. In fact, a lot of people water this way. The water soaks up, moves up, and eventually the top of the soil is wet. Well, how can that be? Gravity is pulling this water down, and yet the water goes up. Well, the explanation here is that there are really two forces at play. Gravity is pulling water down, but there's something else called capillary action that's pulling the water up. Remember I had mentioned that water is kind of sticky, so it sticks to the soil particles. It coats the soil particles with this layer of water, and it does that with the ones at the bottom of the pot first, coats them, and then those are touching the particle above, and so water creeps up around that one, and so on and so on until it gets to the top of the pot. But there's a limit as to how much water will creep up this pot because gravity is also pulling it down. And these two forces become balanced. Gravity pulling down, capillary action pulling up. So we accept the fact that we have these two forces. And what you would expect is that all of the soil is equally wet. But that's not what happens. When we look at the soil that's in this pot, we find that the top part is pretty much equally wet. 
Gravity has pulled the water out of the large pore spaces, but the particles are still coated with water. And at the top of the pot, it's pretty much all the same. Lots of air, lots of water. Something unusual happens at the bottom of the pot. The bottom layer is super saturated. We can illustrate that in this diagram. This is a pot of soil. The two forces are active, gravity pulling down, capillary action pulling up. But we get this layer at the bottom, which is in blue. In this area, all of the pore spaces are filled with water. Gravity is not strong enough to pull that water out. And so we have this area that's completely saturated. This area at the bottom of the pot can be called the saturation zone. That's where the soil is completely full of water, even the large pore spaces. But a lot of gardeners have started calling this the perched water table. Now that term is not exactly correct, but it's fairly close. And since a lot of gardeners are using this now, I'll go with that term, the perched water table. So how large is the perched water table? Well, it turns out that it's a height that's important. And that height is based on the soil, not the pot. It's the quality of the soil that makes a difference. Organic matter, things like peat moss and core and compost, are stickier with water than things like sand. Large particles have larger pore spaces than smaller particles. So it's the quality of the soil that determines the height of the perched water table. It has nothing to do with the container. Here's an example to illustrate this fact. Here are four different pots. On the far left is our standard pot and it has a certain height for the perched water table. To the right of it is a skinny tall pot, and it's full of soil, but the height of the perched water table is exactly the same as in the first pot. It doesn't matter how much soil you put above it, and it doesn't matter how big the pot is. In the next example over, we have a shallower pot, but it's really wide. And again, the height of the perched water table is exactly the same. And then finally, we have a very tiny pot. You'd think that a small pot would hold less water and the perched water table would become smaller, but that's not what happens. The height of the perched water table is exactly the same in a small pot than a large pot. So why is this information useful? Well, roots don't like to be in that saturation zone. They don't like 100% water. They prefer a mixture of air and water. Roots that are too wet can rot. So if we look at these four pots, the one on the far right has the least amount of suitable soil in it. So it's not very good for plants. Making the pot wide doesn't really change a lot either because the percent of saturated soil is still the same. Taller pots are better than wider pots because there is more soil that's not saturated. So if you're having problems with rotting roots, Go with a tall pot. Now let's ask a different question. What happens when I put gravel in the bottom of this pot? Water doesn't move very well from soil into gravel. And the reason is that the particle size is very different. Water does not flow from one soil type to another soil type when the particle size is very different. Now that's true both in pots and in your garden. That's why in the garden, you never want to layer different types of soil on top of one another. You always want to mix them. Well, in a pot, if we put stones in the bottom and soil above that, the water doesn't move easily from the soil to the stones. But the soil still has a perched water table. That property of soil doesn't change. So by adding stones in the bottom, we've moved up the perched water table, but the height of the perched water table is exactly the same as in a pot without stones. So what have we done by adding stones? Well, in effect, we've reduced the amount of soil that's not saturated, and that's not good for plants. So not only do the stones not improve drainage, but they actually increase the amount of super saturated soil after you water. So now I've given you the technical explanation of what happened, but how do you demonstrate that this is actually what's going on in a pot? Well, it's kind of difficult. 
But there was an experiment done a while ago that took some really interesting pictures. This container contains two different types of soil. So the bottom layer could be sandy soil, and the top layer could be our standard potting mix. The left-hand diagram shows the results of adding a small amount of water. It stays in that top layer. When we add more water, you might expect that the water runs down into the sandy part, but that's not what happens. In fact, as you add more water, it moves sideways and stays in the potting mix. It doesn't go into the sand, and that's what you see in the center picture. Remember I said water does not move easily from one type of soil to another, and this clearly demonstrates that phenomenon. As you add more and more water, you finally saturate that top layer, and then gravity takes over and pulls some of that water into the sandy layer. This clearly demonstrates the point I made earlier, that water does not move from one type of soil into another type of soil. So how do you demonstrate the existence of the perched water table? I've really only come up with one good way to do that. So I have my pot of soil here, and I've let it drain so that all the excess water comes out the bottom. The theory is that we have this perched water table at the bottom, and it has a specific height. And that height is based on the type of soil in the pot. What if I change the size of the pot? What happens? Well, if I make this a skinny pot, what should happen is that the height of the water table stays the same. But since there's less soil at the bottom of the pot, the excess water should run out. Now, how can I make this pot skinnier? Well, there's actually a very simple way to do that. If you tip the pot, a whole bunch of water runs out. What I've done here is I've made a skinny pot and the excess water has run out. Now let me show you that in a diagram format. The diagram on the left is our standard pot, and it has a perched water table, and that perched water table has a specific height. The diagram on the right is that same pot, but now it's turned partially on its side. The height of the perched water table remains the same. That doesn't change. But you can see in the first diagram, we have a rectangle which holds a larger amount of soil than the area on the right, which is a triangle. There is less soil in the perched water table in the diagram on the right than there is on the one on the left. And since this area is saturated with water, the excess water has to run out. And that's exactly what we've seen when we tipped the pot. Tipping the pot is a very elegant demonstration of the perched water table. And it's something you can do yourself. Next time you fill a pot with water, let it run out the bottom, make sure it's very saturated. Let it sit until nothing else drips out. Turn the pot partially on its side and excess water will run out. I hope that's convincing. It's the best demonstration I've found anywhere. Now let's summarize what we've learned. Gravel at the bottom of a pot does not increase drainage. Once we've added enough water to a pot, there's always a perched water table at the bottom. If we have layers of soil, like gravel in the bottom, that perched water table moves up. But the height of the perched water table doesn't change. The amount of perched water table depends on the soil, not on the pot or the shape of the pot. It also doesn't depend on how many holes you have in the bottom. That does not change it. If you've enjoyed this video, I have a whole bunch of other myth-busting videos that you'll love. And you can get to them right here. Happy gardening.